I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. The country is riveted on the question of whether there'll be justice for black people. The murders, the police killings of young black men uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, the killing of Eric Garner in Staten Island, New York, others like that raise questions in our minds, in our community, and in fact around the country and around the world. Today, we want to talk about that issue. Is there justice for our people? What strategies do we have to employ to ensure that there is justice for our people, justice for all people? How do we make the American dream real for our people and not a joke, not a mockery? I'm pleased to have some young people here out of Twin Cities who are committed to creating opportunity and seeking justice for our people in their daily lives, in their political lives, in their business lives, in their cultural and social life. Uh, my guests include Nick Muhammad. He's the founder, organizer uh, of Titan Administration. He's CEO of that company. He's part of a group called Torch Light World Foundation, and he is an artist and activist. I've known him as one of the guiding lights in the hip-hop movement. Uh, I go to him to get a sense of what the spirit and feeling, the knowledge, the energy of the hip-hop movement is around the development of community. Also, Kenya McKnight, uh, I call her part of the same uh, wavelength, the same group, uh, Young Lions, Young Leaders. She is the head of the Black Women's Business Alliance. She presides over that organization. She is a community and political activist, has been a candidate for office in Minneapolis, and I expect she'll be one in the future as well. My guests include Andre Cohen. He's with AM Horizons Training Group. He's a community activist, and he's involved in the question of ethics, moral behavior, training uh, for police and law enforcement people. And then my special guest is a, a friend uh, and neighbor in North Minneapolis, Demetrius Pendleton. Demetrius has uh, this unique and powerful story. It's a tragic story. It's a sad story. He lost his daughter, uh, Brandy, and her friend Melvin Jones due to negligent driving. So he's been an advocate about people being responsible uh, in driving, use of drugs, use of alcohol, but he's also telling a story about how the system ends up being not responsive when black lives are lost. So I'm interested in how these things connect. Here's a story of a father who mourns the loss of a daughter, who's waiting for justice, and whose experience includes the fact that it took five months before the white guy that killed his daughter was even charged. And another five months have passed before a court date, which may happen in February. Uh, we're wondering, is that fair? Is that right? And you wonder that, particularly when you're dealing with the issues of Ferguson and the issue of Staten Island, where is justice for our people? Well, let me throw it out, first of all, to uh, uh, Brother Nick Muhammad. Uh, Nick, I'm so pleased to see young people on the street, not depending on the so-called old leadership, but speaking in their own voice of their own agency, saying that we must make a change. How do you assess the energy around the country right now in response to both Ferguson, Missouri, and to what's happened in New York? Yeah, well, if I had to assess the energy, I would say that they're, they're tired, and they're also very intelligent. Their logic works perfectly and they're trying to figure out what new changes, what new initiatives, what new landmark, you know, legislative protections can be taken to prevent the same thing from happening. So that's one of the things that I'm proud of, just watching them do what they do and joining them in some of the measures that they're taking. Um, marching is the first thing that, you know, they go to because it's one of the, the most, you know, celebrated in history of, getting things done. Mm -hmm. 
Um, however, they're, they're also very mindful that that's step one, right? So there's an entire process and an entire system that's supposed to be backing them up that's currently failing them. So my assessment is that they're very focused. Um, they're very aware that there needs to be structural change. And, and I'm just trying to support them as much as I can. Do our people understand uh, the gravity of the situation? Are we looking in the community as, as if this is a series of isolated incidents, or do we see this as part of a systemic assault on uh, black people, uh, on young people, on our identity and our culture? What do you think? Well, here we have a unique you know, situation in Minnesota. Where, where there's, you know, barely, you know, 350,000 African Americans or people from the African diaspora here. Whereas across the country, we have other states that, that have large black populations mm -hmm. where, you know, there's a little bit more camaraderie there. Here, however, our endeavors and our, our plight here hasn't sparked that consolidation of black aggregation. And there's a, a, a spectrum of the way that we look at this as a community. There's those who have, you know, the perspective that they somehow must have deserved what they got, and these are black people, right? And then there's those who are, you know, highlighting the quote unquote black on black crime, even though we know that if you commit a crime as a black person of any caliber, you're going to jail. There is no question of you walking out of the jail. And then there's those who, you know, realistically, the, the youth, who watch all of us so-called educated leaders watch us make the same mistakes. And so from, from my vantage point, it's just at some point we have to get down to the one conversation we don't want to have that the country doesn't want to have, which is black aggregation. So I think that's where we're headed to, you know, with things like Black Lives Matter and people not falling for the all lives matter spin. Keeping us centered on ourselves seems to be are the problem we've had in the last 40 years or so as far as being Go into that. All lives matter versus black lives matter. What do you mean? That's uh Well, okay, so um, there's, you know, hashtags, the, the black youth run Twitter, period. Uh, the company will show you the metrics on that. And so every time they, they make a movement or they want to communicate an event or a protest of some sort, they come up with these things called hashtags. There was a hashtag that was put out there to kind of show solidarity. So whatever you put forth on social media, you attach this hashtag to it to show that you're in solidarity with people who you know live by that mantra. So the mantra was Black Lives Matter. And given the plight of you know uh, Terrence Franklin, Trayvon Martin, and now as recently as you know uh, Tamir Rice, we're we're saying, look, there's obviously a problem with the system valuing Black life. Black lives matter. And when people hit the street, all across the board, white, black, whoever, were all on that mantra. There's a sector of quote unquote progressive liberals that you know love to co-opt these opportunities to try to tackle on different agendas. And you know, instead of saying Black Lives Matter, because by saying Black Lives Matter, it, somehow they're imagining that it diminishes other lives. And their take is that all lives matter. And so they come out with their mantra, all lives matter, and they're missing the point. Mm -hmm. First of all, they're not acknowledging their privilege to go out and take a mantra that was produced by the youth. This is how they feel. Support them. They didn't ask you to change or <laughs> modify how they feel. And secondly, black lives do matter. The issue here seems to be with black lives. We can't even, uh, as, as one officer did in St. Louis, he pulled out his baton and hit a young white college student on the hand with his baton and was immediately fired, okay, and hit with a felony charge hmm. at the same time that the, the Mike Brown case was going on. So if you want to talk about the, the value of life, how is it that a young white male can get, you know, an officer fired mm -hmm. for hitting him on a hand with a baton and a young black boy is shot down in the street for supposedly some cigars, right? Or even worse, case scenario, you have situations where people like Michael Vick was literally jailed for fighting his dogs, mm -hmm. and the country was outraged at the plight of the dogs. Mm -hmm. But you have black human beings shot down in the street, and they haven't received as much justice as the dogs. That's what the issue is. Mm -hmm. That's why black lives need to be understood as mattering. 
It's not about all lives. All lives aren't facing the same things as black lives in this country. Did any of you see the uh, video uh, on Facebook about uh, a white guy at a Burger King or McDonald's uh, being arrested by two white cops? And uh, they tried to get him on the ground, get his hands behind his back, uh, kind of gently, kind of nicely, and he was able to uh, stand up, throw him off, and then run around, beat one of them up, <laughs> run out the store, run up and down the street. Now, the video ended there. So I'm sitting there, like, dumbfounded. How can uh, this happen? I mean, they tased the guy, but he wasn't affected by the taser. Well, he and did so, die later. Huh? He did die. He did die. He did die. Okay, so I didn't know that. He would see drugs in the system at okay, the time as okay, well, so he okay. did die. But I'm just amazed at how, yeah. you know, they gave him that kind of leeway. Can you... What does that say to you? Uh, I was downtown Minneapolis a couple of years ago, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing as I was driving right there at uh, First Ave. And I seen uh, um, the cops trying to put this young white guy in the car, and he was on his cell phone while they were trying to put him in the car, and he kept yanking his arm as they were trying to grab him. And I just I thought to myself, I'm dead by now, mm -hmm. right? Or at least beat down severely, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, privilege, power. Um, the advancement of white supremacy. I mean, I think that it, it certainly gives us, um, we know or at least believe to a large degree that um, white people value themselves more than anyone. In fact, they work so hard to um, establish themselves as a standard of what everything should be and um, how we should look at the world. And so I think what I've gathered, at least from my own family and um, just people around is that people are, are kind of um, paralyzed by injustice in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense that kind of has us complacent where we're just like, oh, you know, this is not gonna happen or, oh. You know, we knew, you know, they were gonna lie. Oh, we didn't expect a conviction, right? I mean, so it's, it's, it's I think, disenfranchised us so much and it has paralyzed our spirits to such a degree that we don't expect anything different than what we're seeing out here. And so that's, that's um, those messages continue to tell me that there's a value um, for white life because the power of the system is garnered by white people. And, and so they value their own and not us and, you know. Andre, jump in here if you would. What do you do in training uh, people to consider ethics and morality in the discharge of uh, law enforcement? Yeah. What's, what's your company, first of all? What do you do? Yeah, so uh, at AM Horizons, we, we uh, specialize in working with government and nonprofit institutions around ethics and bias, um, or, or the elimination of ethics and bias. And so um, in those conversations, we spend a lot of time um, trying to reconnect people with the idea that all human life um, is valuable. And Oftentimes what, what happens, particularly with police officers, is that they sometimes forget that as they're going about their day-to-day -day business. Uh, policies and procedures become the mandate as opposed to um, what they're supposed to be protecting, which is the Constitution of the United States. And so we, they spend uh, a great deal of time becoming trail horses, uh, if you will. I don't know if you've ever ridden a trail horse, but you never ride a trail horse. You get on the horse's back. Uh, because the horse has done that so often that they just go down the trail. And so uh, trying to get uh, officers and government officials, social workers, to think critically about the lives that they're engaging becomes the, uh, the, the primary objective of, of everything that we do. And so how do we do that? We, we start by some basic premises in talking about the Constitution of the United States. Um, you would be surprised at the number of people um, in the general population that don't even know the Bill of Rights. Um, you'd be even more surprised at the number of law enforcement individuals who are supposed to be protecting and serving that great document that have no clue uh, or have a limited clue of what is, what is in that document. Um, and, and so uh, a great deal of that, that time that we, and energy that we spend with them is to reacquaint them with, with that great and sacred document that has been used as a two-edged sword both for and against black people. Um, and so we, we cause people to, to think critically about that. Um, my father was a, a Black Panther in the 60s. Um, 
was saved by God's grace in the 70s and became a, a, a Pentecostal preacher. And within that, trans, that, that transition, one of the things that uh, became very clear to me was that we have a moral imperative and a social imperative simultaneously to have critical conversations about the liberation of people. Um, what we know about freedom is that freedom is contextual. Freedom is a condition of membership to an organized body or to a nation state. However, liberty is without borders. Liberty is without uh, constraints. And so all too often, people are seeking freedom when they should be seeking liberty. And so as we, as we move forward, and, we, and I see the young people laying down in 35W, stopping traffic, and I see um, uh, malls being shut down on Black Friday, I get excited because the revolution continues. And one of the things that young people are learning today is that um, the revolution can have no head. There can be no board of directors for the revolution that is happening because we know what happens when there is a hierarchy, when there is a system that, that organizes these things, um, that, that gets, uh, the head gets cut off, it gets dismembered, it, it becomes a, a disembodied spirit. And so I'm, I'm so excited to see that uh, there are young people on the ground doing this work because while I'm in the office, when I'm in the boardroom, when I'm talking to other folks, I'm doing my part where I'm supposed to do my, my efforts. And so I will support them as much as I can doing what they do while I'm continually doing what I do in, in the sphere of influence that I have. And so those become the, the, the this new revolution is, is all about being decentralized. It is about uh, being crafty and thoughtful. Um, I, I found it very interesting that, that Tupac Shakur understood something that lots of folks uh, underestimated from a so-called rapper. But he understood that he was writing the curriculum of the future. And so as, uh, as white people were listening to his music, he was infusing them with, with, with hope, with black ideals, um, some of which have been misguided, have been misused and, and, and usurped um, in this modern day hip hop. Um, but uh, he understood that the music has power and that um, that will be the, uh, the chorus of the curriculum of the future. So um, as I do my work, I try to carry, carry those things out. So let me raise a question. You talked about, uh, you know, uh, officers being clueless about the, um, uh, the amendments or the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. <clears throat> if they are clueless about that, exactly what do they think they're doing? What is it they, they think they've been trying to do or hired to do? They are doing their job. Which is what? And that is the key question, right? And so a lot of times we, we don't ask our county commissioners, mm -hmm. what exactly is the sheriff's responsibility? Mm -hmm. And so they will say protect and serve, but we never follow up with the question, protect and serve who and protect and serve what? Um, what is very clear to us is that property is probably the primary thing that is used uh, where law enforcement is used to protect and serve. Um, secondly, um, I would even say that it's not just black lives because black lives are important. It is also native lives because the plight that's happening to, native, uh, to African Americans is multiplied by 10 or to 100 for native Americans. So. Um, so I, I think that's important, but also if you're a person in poverty, if you're a person in color, the law enforcement does not see you as an ally. They see you as a, a force to be reckoned with, someone to be concerned about, uh, even in their own ranks. I mean, if we look at the, the murder of, uh, uh, do, uh, it, not necessarily the murder, because it wasn't uh, uh, directly related to his death, but um, do in, um, Ingo, who was uh, an officer um, on the drug task force in, uh, in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. who was shot by another officer from the uh, he wasn't Minneapolis. Killed. He was shot. He, he was shot. Yeah, but right, he right. he did commit suicide mm -hmm. um, in uh, 2010. He committed suicide, um, and I would imagine that that shooting by a fellow officer, uh, if it was military, we would call it friendly fire, had, may have had a place in his um, his his suicide, and so. 
what, what are we supposed to be protecting and serving? And what typically happens is that uh, we look at budgets that we're protecting and serving, we look at uh, policies and procedures that we're protecting and serving, and people never enter in to the conversation. Um, I recall being at a, uh, at a, uh, a, a, a national or, or, and state uh, organization for sheriffs. And one of the um, executive directors stands up in front of folks and says, we have a budget crisis in our jail systems. And so therefore, we must figure out ways to um, increase the number of people in our beds. <laughs> so here I am, a taxpayer, paying, a, uh, paying to, for protection and service, and they're plotting ways to, to, to fill their beds so that they keep their, uh, their jobs. So the point uh, of my question was that precisely. It seems to me, in part, uh, the agenda is suppression uh, and the uh, continued marginalization of black people, oppression of black people, and to relegate uh, our bodies and our experience as fodder for their benefit. I say it this way. They get the money, we get the misery. And so they appropriate money all day, every day, and they build institutions like prisons, uh, welfare systems, and other things that they benefit from while they propose that they are solving a problem that they've identified as us. Nick, what do you think about this conversation? Where, where does this take you in terms of uh, your feelings, uh, this analysis? What do you think? Um. <clears throat> I got to say that my point of contention in some of the perspectives Brother Andre is very simple. I've been an organizer for about 15 years actively, and I've done music tours, you know, infused with civic engagement from here all the way out to the East Coast. And the communities that I am generally engaged in working with is the black community. One of the things that strikes me today that's interesting, because I also am currently working with a lot of different organizations. We just trained 34 organizers of color uh, with state voices. And the one thing that struck me as I was organizing and you know going through the trainings with everyone, whenever I reached out to the Hmong community, Asian Pacific Islander, Native community, Latino community, when they invited me to sit down with them, they invited me into their facility built for their community to focus on their issues. And no one seemed to have a problem with that. But when it was time for me to work with the African American community, we were meeting in other people's facilities. The issue is that we don't organize ourselves. We try to save everyone and save no one because we don't save ourselves. Our children are being buried not because we don't know how to work with everyone else, because that's all we do is work with everyone else. I have no time, space, or capacity or interest in trying to re-educate white people on the value of black lives. We've been doing that since we have got here. Anyone with two brain cells will be able to understand that I am a human being with 10 fingers and 10 toes and a mind and extremities. However, the policies in this country clearly reflect that our people continue to have to educate their people to this fact. Where we're at today, right now, the critical thing that's missing in our community is focal points of aggregation, focal points of our resource, focal points of our unity. And it's crucial because we don't, we don't get justice. If someone is saying that all lives matter, my qualm is this. If you're sitting in a room full of people who I can bet the predominant makeup of that room was probably what? Even though you were there, you were not there in the capacity of the interests of black people per se. You were there because they hired you to be there to help them cope with some of the ills of their makeup and their dynamic. That is not our issue. That does not speak to the test of the, the problems that black people face in a capacity of solving these problems. Nick, hold on. I'm going to come back. I'm Al McFarland. You're listening to, watching Conversations with Al McFarland. We're talking about the, uh, the aftermath of Ferguson and of uh, Staten Island, the, the issue of uh, the disregard of black life, the difficulty uh, for the attainment of justice for black people. Stay tuned.
I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. I continue my conversation with uh, bright young voices in our community uh, reflecting our concern, uh, our uh, discussion of the issue of justice and the issue of police accountability, uh, whether uh, and how we will attain what we believe is um, uh, justice for our people, uh, the ability to say that uh, the America we've been taught is the real America that uh, accords freedom and um, respects the dignity of every human being, every black man, every black woman, and all human beings. My guests include Nick Muhammad, who is the uh, CEO of Titan Administra Administration, uh, an organization creating music in the hip hop uh, genre. Uh, he also heads Torchlight US, I believe, Foundation. And uh, Kenya McKnight is the uh, president of the Black Women's Business Alliance. She's a political activist and community organizer. Uh, Andre Cohen heads AM Horizons Training Group, uh, active in community as well, and Demetrius Pendleton, whose story is a uh, powerful one. Demetrius, let me talk to you first of all for this segment. Uh, I mentioned earlier that your daughter uh, was killed in an automobile accident. Tell that story first of all. What happened to your daughter? Uh, describe her to our listeners and our viewers. Okay, my daughter by the name of Brandy Ann Banks Suta. She was a young, um, very brilliant, intelligent young lady. She had just celebrated her birthday. She was 21 years old. Her birthday was May the 20th. Um, her and a friend by the name of Melvin Jones was sitting in the car for Highway 55 in Morgan. And um, a gentleman by the name of Philip Bertelson um, was driving um, drunk, doing 115 miles per hour, ran into the back of their car, killed both of them instantly. Um, three more other cars was involved in it. And um, the family has been getting no justice at all. Um, what really um, perplexed me about this whole case and this whole scenario is this gentleman um, killed two young black people, and he was a Caucasian man. I'm not racist at all, and I want to put that on the record, but killed two black people, and they was doing nothing but sitting in the car. But what they wound up doing was leaving this man off of the record for five months. They did not charge this man until five months later. And when they charged him, they said his name. They had court, which was April the 23rd. He went to court, the man got out the same day. And which was really the spit in the face to the family was, they didn't even set bail for this man. They let this man out on his own reconscience. They didn't have any type of, um, they didn't tell the family of any structures that he would be going through. He would have abrasions on his leg or anything that he couldn't drive, et cetera. Um, what was really hard about the whole thing is every time they set court up for a month in advance, a month in advance, and every time we have to show up in court, they will always do a continuous, a continuous, a continuous. This happened to this person, that happened to that person. And it's just been time after time that the family hasn't been getting any justice at all. And um, it just hurts the family to um, have to go through this, and it's just like, an agony pain that it hits you right in the gut to where you just don't know what to do. And um, is there any justice going to be um, sorted out for this young child? As you go to think about it, it's a lot of people has been getting drunk driving charges. You look at um, the cake boss when he got pulled over driving his yellow um, Corvette. He was arrested immediately. You think about um, um, just like different people who has um, high profile cases. Um, Michael Phelps, fastest woman in the world. They charged him face on a camera immediately. Well, how did this man get out for killing two people and they wait five months before they even mention this man's name? And that's like one of the parts where we feel that the family's not going to get any justice. They're going to try to throw this case under the rug like they always do. And the family's just going to be... Um, discombobulated like they are when they said no bail everybody just like went in a rage I mean what do you mean no bail this man killed two lives and it could have not been an African-American person in a Caucasian area and kill two Caucasian kids and get no bail I mean any African-American man who gets 
any type of case. He can have a case if it was trying to sell um, alcohol and move cigarettes, and he will get a bond or he will get killed, um, what we are seeing on the television. And so that's, that's the connection I'm looking for, and obviously uh, all of us uh, have our deepest sympathy for your family, and we express our uh, both outrage and our sadness for uh, the loss of these two uh, innocent young lives. That's tragic, and it's more tragic, though, that Hennepin County has not uh, brought the weight of the law from what we understand against this driver who was negligent and who caused two people to lose their lives. And so when you think about that, then you watch television uh, and you see what happened in Ferguson, though your family's case is not a question of police violence, and you see what happened in New York, though your family's case is not a case of police violence. It is a qu question, however, of how the institution responds to our people. What do you think and what do you feel? Well, I'm, I'm feeling like applauded by it because I'm feeling that the family may not get any justice, that it's going to be just us at the end of the road. Because nine times out of ten, anybody that sustained a tragedy or a death, the first thing people are not going to do is get any counseling. And that's the mistake number one. Number two, if anybody that's newer than myself, they should always write out a living will. So you won't have family members or anybody fighting over some money that isn't there. Because you just, you, you will be amazed at what people will do for a piece of a dollar. But um, I'm saying this from my heart. I'm not saying this because it's made up or anything. But a lot of people that get killed in car accidents, it's just not drinking and driving. It's texting and driving. It's being negligent and driving. You have more people that's getting killed because of texting and driving and negligent driving than drinking and driving. But drinking and driving has always been a problem in the state of Minnesota. And Minnesota has given people slaps on the wrist. As I was going over the ballot, I've seen Michelle McDonald name on the ballot and she got pulled over for drinking and driving, but they said they cleared her for it because she never was able to take a drinking and driving, et cetera, blood test or what have they. So she just did the no contest. Andre, what's the ethics uh, as you see it? Uh, if you're thinking about it, ethics and, and law enforcement justice without having the details yep. at the surface, how does it sound to you? What do yeah, you feel like? It, 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 it certainly feels as though um, folks without finances um, are the enemy of the state. And so um, it, it certainly appears that uh, public defenders um, uh, should, in, in many cases, be relabeled as public offenders uh, in the sense that um, families aren't able to, to get justice. And so um, the system is failing us in a number of ways. And when I say us, I mean all people, but I also mean specifically black people, um, the system is failing. Um, the, the, the system of court fines is, is, you know, just asinine because if you can't pay the first fine, then you get a second fine for not paying the first fine. And so before you, you know it, you're, um, you're in a situation where you're in a, in, um, in a debtor's uh, prison, so to speak, um, finding yourself running from the law because you don't have the ability to, to, to pay these fines. Uh, at the same time, if you don't have the, the money to defend yourself, then you find yourself in that in a very similar situation. So it, it certainly seems that the, the table has turned and that the, the state sees its citizens as, as enemies. And in this particular case, uh, black folks seem to be the, the, the pinnacle of that negative aggression towards, um, towards its citizens. So Kenya, what do we do? How do we organize our communities, our families, so that number one, we resist uh, oppression, and that number two, we take uh, both control and authority over family, uh, over community, and we take the position that we, in fact, uh, are the government in our neighborhood, right? That this is ours and that we will either set the law or change the law, that we are the law. Right now, we're outside of it. <laughs> we're oppressed by the law, it seems to me, uh, and that's maybe a gross simplification, but there ought to be a place where we come to say that, you know, that the law is in us and it reflects our dignity, our vision, our family, our desire to create a society that makes sense to us. What do you think? Sure. I, I mean, I have a ton of thoughts, but I, I think ultimately um, I 
go back to this quote that my uncle um, Shamsuddin told me years ago, is that he who controls the image controls the reality. And in that, I think one of the first places to start is that we have to control our own image. Mm -hmm. And the way we see ourselves, um, in part, is not from our own perspective and interest. It's from what's been projected upon us. And so we have to redefine who we are and how we see ourselves and what our value is as a people and not continue to react to what others say we are or are not. I think that's a starting place. But ultimately, we have to fight. Mm -hmm. um, as we've had to fight and work hard for everything um, and since we've been here. And so that's not new, but it's certainly apparent. And we've not gotten even George Zimmer, Zer, uh, Zimmerman arrested without fighting, right? We had to fight. And we had to make the world stand up with us just to get um, him arrested. And so I think it, it's a testimony to the fact that it's something that we have to continue to do. But we also have to educate ourselves about process, laws, policies. I remember um, I have a brother who's deceased now, murdered, and then one who's doing 27 years in prison. And so I was both of their attorney, right, plus their legal advocate, and, and didn't know um, anything about none of that. But I knew I had to fight. Um, to make the state of Minnesota change its policies about how our families um, who are victims of, you know, you know, these crimes, you know, are supported. And they didn't want to support us, but after fighting and fighting coming downtown St. Paul, um, they, they still didn't support us, but they ended up changing their entire process and policies because we fought mm -hmm. hard um, so that no family would have to go through what we went through, where on one end, Hennepin County says that my brother's a victim, and on the other hand, the state of Minnesota says that he aided and abetted in his own death. And um, for a crime that he had not been charged for, nor brought to court for because he was dead already. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so we had to bring that contradiction to them and fight. But if I didn't read their policies and procedures, if I didn't you know, bounce that against what I knew was logically um, correct in my mind and bring it to him and fight, then that wouldn't have happened. And I want to just say that the great Albert Pike said, when laws and logic conflict, laws are changed. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to stand our grounds on what we know is right and what's best and take it to the people and take it to the policies and demand that it's changed. And we also have to know that America is also our country. We're not just visitors. We own this country also. We're shareholders. We're stakeholders. And we have a right to be here, a right to exist, and a right to access to any opportunity that we want in this country. And we don't need to ask permission from anybody for, you know, for anything that we need and want. And so I think it's about changing our minds about how we see ourselves, how we see this world. I don't really care about what white people or anybody else think about black people. What I care about is how, what I think and what other black people think. And that's the premises that I operate from. And that's, I think we have to get to that place and not feel like we need to be a rainbow coalition and be concerned with justice for everybody. We do. We are humanitarians. That's been established since the beginning. Um, but what isn't established is that we care about ourselves enough to go hard for ourselves. There is not, like Nick said, there, and, and, and I'm unapologetically interested and support and promote black people and black interests. But when you go into these settings, when we get under this umbrella of people of color, Right? When we talk about this idea of all life matters, in our minds, we want to show that we care and we connect it to other people. And other people want to connect to us. And I get that. But like I tell anybody, unless you've been through our experience over the entire nearly 500 years in the exact same way that we have, then we are not the same. We do have differences. And we need to make sure that we're OK um, with our differences and promoting our own interests and self. And so, if, if we start anywhere, in my mind, we start there. And um, that is the mentality, the force that we take wherever we go, wherever we are at all times. Kenya, thank you. Uh, well said, Sorry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> you know, so let me close the segment with this uh, a word of appreciation and thanks for all of you. First of all, again, our condolences to your family and our standing with you and your family in searching for justice uh, and uh, um, you know, the proper discharge of justice uh, in the case of the person who killed your, your daughter. And let me stand with uh, uh, you um, 
Nick and Kenya and Andre uh, celebrating you as young and gifted uh, visionary leaders who are committed uh, and you demonstrate this confidence that I think is absolutely critical because uh, I don't hear any of you asking for white people's approval for the freedom, for the liberty that you seek. And you believe, I, I think, that uh, you will create a world that reflects your decency and your dignity and that there's no contradiction between uh, 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 saving black life and saving all life, but our focus is saving black life. If we can't look at saving black life, all life will not be saved. That's what I hear you saying. And so black folks, we got to deal with our family, our culture in a way that is celebratory, that is serious, that is conscientious, that is persistent, and that is relentless. And we think the change we seek for ourselves is the change that will benefit humankind. Thank you for joining us. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Food is still a struggle for me, so that's been my hardest struggle, I think. Coming from, you know, my background, my culture background, what we eat is always fried foods or and a lot of rice. We don't measure our rice and stuff like that. It's hard to unfry chicken. We do fast during Easter season, so I have not had meat since early March. And I tell you when Easter comes in the next couple weeks, I need some ham. <laughs> some chicken, some something. I feel that as a community, and communities are formed wherever we are. Communities are in our families, communities are in our workplace, communities are in the neighborhoods in which we, uh, we dwell. Role modeling, I think, is one of the main keys that I would suggest as maybe the foundation of the challenge. I don't want to say problem, but challenge. Role modeling begins with each and every one of us. And as we look at what we purchase at the corner stores, what we're having at our church potlucks, what we're having for breakfast, if we have breakfast, uh, what we're doing when we eat breakfast at home and then eat breakfast at school, eat breakfast at home and eat breakfast at work, what we choose to have for breakfast. If you think about breakfast from the standpoint of three to four eggs, two slices of bacon, four uh, slices of toast, um, and a cup of hot chocolate. Let's just say we had that. If we look at that in portions, that's a lot of food. And when you have something like that and someone else is seeing you eat that, it's almost like giving us a permission to say, it's okay, they're doing it, I can do it. It's okay. And after all, it's just breakfast and I'll eat less at the next meal. But all those decisions about food can have a big connection with what we're gonna do the next meal. And let's say we had no breakfast at all. And by the time we get to lunch, we're like overeating because we missed breakfast. And then we triple the amount of food. Again, what you're selection, selecting, someone else is seeing what you're doing. Fear that I will give up or find an excuse not to come to the workouts, uh, find an excuse not to eat healthier. That's been my biggest fear. We all have a choice and we're taught choices then we become older and we make our own choices. We need to look at choices from a standpoint of, is it good for us?
Why do you want to lose weight? Why do you want to eat healthy? If you really probe into why you want to do something, the answer is there for you. And that begins the stage of development of your choices. The biggest challenge is to adjust my eating habits uh, and try to cook healthier. I have been always trying to lose weight for a really long time. Sometimes I'll get into doing some fitness and then lease slack on the food side. I always tell people to remember that we still want you to eat no matter what you're doing. Enjoy the experience, but remember what you do at home with portions, uh, increasing your fruits and vegetables, looking at the color on your plate to determine do I have those different groups that and what makes sense. It's still, it's still doable, even when you go to a restaurant. I fear that I will give up or find an excuse not to come to the workouts. Uh, find an excuse not to eat healthier. That's been my biggest fear. You need to fail in order to learn. Failure is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a Failure is not great if you stay in failure. So my failure to continue my exercise and continue uh, being as active out as I was is not a total failure because I'm back to working to where I need to be. We all have a choice and we're taught choices then we become older and we make our own choices. We need to look at choices from a standpoint of, is it good for us? I've been really, you know, trying to stay strict and portioning my food and measuring my rice intake if I ever have it. Just going along with the dietitian and meeting up with the life coach has really been helping me to kind of get those goals and make sure I'm reaching them. I've been able to make just really delicious food and not miss really the meat. I just kind of miss the flavor of it sometimes. But I've discovered some other things that will suffice. Mm -hmm. And that's what's brought my, 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 uh, my blood pressure wasn't that high to begin with, but it's brought it even further down. My cholesterol level is down. My weight is down. Everything's down. I can see it in the mirror. I feel it in the way my clothes fit. Um, I can see it in my coworkers' faces, my family's faces. So uh, it's been a tremendous experience. You have to be willing to, to stand out. You have to be willing to um, go against the grain. You can do this Insight to Fitness Challenge for a couple months and really get those principles in place of how to motivate yourself to do exercise, how to lose weight, and how to eat better. It's about each of us making a decision to, make a, to have a healthy lifestyle. A healthy lifestyle is not difficult, it just requires you to think about yourself, and that's not being selfish at all. Oftentimes, when you're trying to make a huge lifestyle change, it's easy to regress and look for the out. And with us, we're not going to give them the out because we're going to make phone calls. We're going to send emails. And when their bodies show up, they don't have to worry about the motivation. I'm going to give them the motivation. I'm not going to give them the out that they're looking for. And so this, that's why this program is so important because we generally care about their success, and so when they show up, um, as long as their body is there, I will take care of the rest. Are you here? Are you here? I just want to win. So you saw your abs for the first time. I felt it. I felt it for a long time. I used to be cut. It's all under the padding now, but there. They came out. Okay. Completely out of breath. Uh, my perspective on week one after day three. Uh, it's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. But I'm glad I'm here. That's all I can say right now. I'm too exhausted for more work. Catch me next time. 
I've always been a competitive person, so kind of pushing those limits has been one of those things for me that this Insight to Health Challenge has really been, I've been able to do that a lot more. And I think even with, especially with Tyrone, he is crazy, crazy hard. But I love being able to go to his workouts and say, I did it, I pushed through the whole hour, hour and 15 minutes sometimes. Thank Alan McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play you a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a roll. Us conversation. Cause this thing is safe. The message is clear. Everybody knows we gotta give it life clear. We just going to talk about the album before.